What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Mining Pod and this week's News Roundup. I'm your guest host, Colin Harper, here with the lovely Will Foxley, as you all know so well. Colin is with me in Denver. I've had a spew of trades lately, Matt Kimmel. Now Colin is here. And we're going to do a little news roundup this week with Colin in the office. For those who listen to the podcast regularly, you know Colin's work, Hash Rate Index, and the Luxor Technologies Group. Uh, and then also, I feel like we just talk about your stuff a lot. So there's that too. Uh, always appreciate the yeah, opportunity to show. I always show. So yeah, if you are listening to this, probably know Colin. If you do not, go check out Hash Rate Index. Go check out their newsletter uh, or their Twitter account. They make great stuff. But we're going to get right to the beat today. We got three stories for our listeners. Uh, of course, there's a lot of deployments this week, and like we could acknowledge those, and we probably should begin. But at this point, like we sort of know who's winning in terms of deployments and buying stuff, so we're not going to go into that too much. We're going to talk about the interesting stuff and even bleed over into some more like Bitcoin topics and necessarily Bitcoin mining. But we will start today with Bitcoin mining story, and that's core scientific. Then we'll talk about blockchain.com having a large hole in balance sheet, and we'll finish up with this Wall Street Journal article about the Bitcoin maintainers, which has not really gone viral, but a lot of Bitcoiners are definitely talking about it. That's a hint up note. Okay, first story, as you can see, if you're watching the video, but I'll read out the headline if you're just listening to the audio. Crypto miner Core Scientific paid more than $1 million to CEO-affiliated personal jet companies, according to Coindesk. Uh, this story actually came out over the summer, but we have a little more details now because it's Chapter 11 filings. Essentially here, uh, Core Scientific was using a affiliate company, the CEO, Mike Levitt, to fly a private jet to and from, I assume his residence and other executives at Core Scientific, and then to their facilities. The excuse being for efficient travel and use of time, Stone Tower Air is a charter flight company used in the past by Core Scientific for primarily transporting employees, clients, and personal or potential clients between our data center sites and remote locations which are often far from major airports. That's according to Chief Mining Officer Russell Can. It's an interesting statement. I will say that, like, yes, there's some remote stuff, but this definitely turned people's headlines. It's a lot of money for a company that's now in Chapter 11. Uh, so definitely something to cover. Want to throw it over to you and get your take on it. Yeah, well, I think you had a pretty good analysis over uh, the summer when we first saw this came out. Um, I don't want to um, I don't want to butcher it because I know this headline says it's like 1.65 mil. Thought like originally we thought it was somewhere between two and four mil in total, not just for 2022. I could be wrong about that, but like you had a tweet basically comparing it to like other industries and like how much their executives spend on jet travel. And it was kind of like, it was a lot more than even like a lot of mainstream tech companies. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, just my quick take is it just kind of speaks to the exuberances that we see in a lot of these administrations uh, that run these Bitcoin mining companies, these public miners. We had some pretty good analysis from one of our analysts, Yaron Melarud at Hash Rate Index. Um, he ran some numbers for uh, public minor administrative costs as a percentage of revenue since 2021. And Core Scientific spent 41% of their revenue on administrative costs since 2021. And that's actually kind of in the middle of the pack. Um, if you look at some other miners, you know, Marathon spent 88%, Iris spent 56%. Uh, Moss in 55%, Clean Spark 53%, Bit Digital 45%, Stronghold 43%, and then we get to Core Scientific coming in at seventh um, overall. These public companies in terms of public sp uh, ed spending for administration um, as a ratio of revenue. So I mean, 41% to me seems pretty high. Um, this is something that Yaren has been harping on for a while. That a lot of these executives of these public miners are very handsomely compensated. Um, and, you know, for investors, a lot of them, I think, are left wondering for what for what purpose, because a lot of these miners are doing very poorly. Um, very few of them were able to build cash over the bear market um, and actually pad themselves to be able to weather what's been going on. So, you know, I, I think that in terms of looking at core scientific, this unfortunately fits the bill for a miner that was really a growth at all costs miner, just taking on massive debt throughout the bull market. And now you see where that's led them, right? They're just sort of in a complete financial hole. Might be able to dig themselves out of it. You know, they, they, they've had a lifeline injected from, I believe, B. Riley. And then was there someone else too that... Um, B. Riley that I remember on some things with Celsius and NIDIG, I think, to help their balance sheet. Yeah. So, you know, it kind of remains to be seen whether or not they'll be able to restructure in such a way where they'll actually keep the core company afloat. 
but um yeah it, it's disappointing to see i will say because these public miners make a lot of splashes in the media for better and worse and this is for one of the worse obviously yeah it's definitely not a great headline you want to see uh you see these things trotted out in like traditional companies as well it's kind of like always the classic headline right personal jet usage yeah. for an executive um I'm sure there'll be more details on this in the next few weeks, and we'll keep an eye out if there is any more details, but we can probably leave that story where it is. Let's talk about blockchain.com. So according to a new Decrypt article that just came out this afternoon, uh, this is February 17th when we are recording this, uh, blockchain.com is shopping assets to fill a $270 million hole from Three Arrows Capital. It's quite a bit bigger than the uh, private plane usage, of course, scientific, <laughs> just for comparison there really quick. Blockchain.com is a legacy company in space. One of the first blockchain explorers out there, one of the first wallets out there. They've had an exchange product. They've had OTC stuff. Uh, I think at one point they did some mining things, right? Yeah, and they were, I mean, I don't know about now, but at one point they were like the largest wallet, like they're the most used wallet yeah. because people would just Google blockchain they would come up and it was like kind of a lot of like newbies first wallets in the space, right? Mm -hmm. um, so seeing something like this, to me, it just shows two things. Like, obviously, like, even the stalwarts, the quote-unquote stalwarts are not free from error and yeah. free from the bear market's claws and teeth. And the other thing, too, it just shows me how kind of incestuous a lot of the fundraising, <laughs> you know, and yeah. um, and, and capital markets are in, in Bitcoin and crypto because we're really seeing contagion and knock-on effects from, it's still from Three Arrows Capital, also from uh, Terra, Luna, and from FTX, I mean, those three collapses, and I guess you could say Celsius as well, sent ripple effects, and we're starting to really see as the tide comes out, you know, who is, you know, swimming naked as the saying goes. Um, and to me, it's also just kind of crazy considering, according to this Decrypt article, the last 18 months, they've raised $500 million. Yeah. So I guess a lot of that money just went into what they thought were good investments at the time that obviously blew up. But I'm I'm always just amazed at how much money gets thrown around in this industry and just evaporated overnight. Definitely. They also laid off 150 people in July 2022 and 110 people in January of this year, uh, which is obviously not a great look. I think for blockchain.com, like to me, the analogy of the way I sort of look at their company is like they kind of are like the pets.com of the space in a sense, right? Like they were there, they got a great name, they're really high SEO ranking. They really had a product that a lot of people talk about. And I think their OTC, their lending products was sort of like their bread and butter for a while, but then that blew up with 3AC, right? Like everyone blew up because of 3AC. Uh, and so now they're going to figure out what their next business line is. And this is a pretty big scoop from Decrypt. Yeah, I was about to say like, well done uh, for Decrypt. This is, you know, some really, really solid reporting. And I'm honestly like, to your point, I'm kind of shocked that they had 150 employees to lay off and still have 150 and 110. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, that, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't even know it was that big. And to your yeah. point about not really having the most viable product, like the OTC space is just so glutted at this point. Yeah. I mean, every exchange has an OTC desk and there are so many, you know, like yeah. um, private companies offering OTC services and things like that. So um, I, you know, I kind of like with the core side thing, unfortunately this doesn't surprise me. Um, but I, I think the bigger thread here is just like how many other players have we not heard about yet that are like yeah. just getting by that are like kind of on life support because of, um, this contag this credit contagion from all these collapses. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you. The one point I want to bring up about the, the volume here and the, and the size of money throwing around, you have to be that big at a certain point for lending products, right? And so I think that's why when we look back, we're like, there's a $2.4 billion hole in Genesis, or there's an X amount of hole in some company out there that's doing lending. Like, that's really the size of the lending market at this point. Right. So, like, you weren't really notable unless you're slinging around millions of dollars or even billions in some cases. And so I, I agree that it's frustrating that we saw so much wealth disappear, but at the same time, you had to be that big to play at the table. And that doesn't mean the game really changes. Right. And then there's also an argument to be made, like, isn't this kind of what most, like, you know, crypto or Bitcoin purists want? Yeah. You know, it's like, you can't bail these companies out. Like, that's the whole point. If they want to lend it and hypothecate their holdings, yeah. try to make yield on it. The whole point about the crypto ecosystem is, yeah, you can 
you know, some, this is obviously super contentious. Like they're like, a, you're more like uh libertarian hard money types who don't want any sort of banking or financial services or very limited ones. Yeah. And, but they're also the same people to say, well, if these things blow up, there's no fed to come and print the money. There's no yeah. one to bail them out. Like we saw with the great financial crisis. Yeah. So um, I'm kind of in one of those camps where I think that blow ups like this, while they suck for the industry short term, they're really healthy for just flushing out more risky players and kind of bolstering some mm. of the more, or like helping entrench some of the ones who are more prudent with the way that they lend their money and the way that they uh, kind of throw their capital around. But, you know, even for some of the one, the lenders that are still around um, or haven't had as much trouble, you know, I won't name any names, but even the ones that survived had a lot of exposure. Yeah to FTX and they're like just barely yeah. hanging on. Even companies that didn't rehypothecate uh, or were like practicing pretty responsible credit uh, processes or standards are struggling, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just a hard market to survive in. Okay, we will leave that one there. Let's go to this last story. Wall Street Journal has put this out on the 16th. It's been turning heads a little bit and that's because of its headline, Bitcoin's future depends on six mysterious coders. Uh, subtitle here or subheader is a handful of developers with the power to change the cryptocurrency software hold an unorthodox role are elusive and have been known to head off disaster for the coin this is an interesting article it's very wall street journal-esque because it sort of just takes something that people in crypto know about and blows it slightly out of proportion with some decent context like i don't think the i don't think the reporting here is terrible but i think it is missing some key details here but that being said you had a different opinion on it so um first. i don't know if i have too much of a different opinion i think that you're right in terms of so my first so first thing i will say is a lot of people reacted to the headline which is you know yeah it's meant to to grab eyeballs and to kind of poke people right yeah but most of the bitcoiners that i've seen on social media who actually read the article said that it was more or less fair but to your point i think that Something like this is just almost hopeless to report on for a mainstream audience because the big yeah. gaping hole in this entire thing was consensus through full node and economic node uh, voting power, right? Yeah. So like in Bitcoin, when we say economic nodes, we mean node operators who are active in um, keeping track of changes and also active in the social consensus side of Bitcoin, um, you know, saying that we want things like Taproot or we don't want things like Taproot. Or like we want things like SegWit or actively rejecting something like a block size increase through SegWit 2x. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that what this article really is missing is like the social layer of Bitcoin and the incentives that go into running a node and rejecting code changes or accepting code changes, which is just frankly like too hard to actually distill. And yeah. I mean, this article is probably like what two thousand words. It, you couldn't really put. You can't just have two paragraphs that say like, oh, but also node operators play a key role in consensus because no one, no one outside of a cadre of like, you know, um, Bitcoin maximalists or Bitcoiners really understand how those dynamics work. And even yeah. some of those people don't understand them very well. And even within those cadres, like it's really contentious over who does what. Like I still see some Bitcoiners say miners don't contribute to the security of Bitcoin. It's node operators. I think that's kind of ridiculous because it's a little bit of both. If you didn't have the hash power, then it would be a lot easier to attack the network. And of course you could keep forking it, but that would just yeah. be such a tireless and Sisyphean like act, <laughs> right? So, I mean, I think that generally the article was somewhat fair. I do agree though, saying that six developers have like the only, it basically like the thesis of the article is that like the six maintainers like Andrew Chow have the only, like have unilateral ability to change the code. Yeah. And like what that is missing is that they only have that option to change the code if everyone more or less roughly agrees in the changes that are being made. Yeah. What I think would be a more interesting article is looking past just the maintainers and doing like a full profile on how Bitcoin core um, developers work because it's more than just Chow, right? Like there are, are you know, 100 plus um, open source developers who are just constantly making, you know, uh, BIPs and, 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 you know, proposing changes to Bitcoin's Bitcoin yeah. core. Um, and some of those things end up getting merged. And yeah, the maintainers eventually end up putting it into the code to package into a new update. Yeah. But like Bitcoin's open source developer ecosystem is 
not huge. And the people who do it, um, to this article's point, like aren't really well compensated for it. And I do think that there's an, an important discussion to be had as Bitcoiners and as, as, as crypto people. Um, that's right. Crypto people too, not just Bitcoiners. Crypto. Um, about what are the incentives that go into this? How do you foster a healthy developer environment? Right. Cause I know that this is one thing that Ethereans love to kind of dunk on Bitcoiners on like the incentives to go develop some crazy decks or like NFT project on Ethereum. The monetary incentives were insane. Yeah. Compared to these Bitcoin core developers who like, maybe if you're lucky, you get like a sponsorship for a hundred thousand a year. Yeah. Right. And some of these other guys are like leaving to go on alternative chains and they're making 250, 500, sometimes a million dollars to code something that just prints money yeah. in the bull market. Um, so overall, I think my take is that it, like this topic needs a lot of nuance. This wasn't the worst article, but it's also not really helpful because it doesn't really get into the actual social mechanisms that yeah. drive Bitcoin. Well put. I like that. I, I agree with you. I don't think there's much more to add there. Uh, I think the article misses a few things. One thing that came to mind was that they talk about how elusive these Bitcoin developers are, but they're pretty easy contact. I mean, if yeah. you've had them on this podcast, just email them. So I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. A lot of their like information is public. Like yeah. I DM, when I was a reporter at CoinDesk, I DM these people all the time. Yeah. Also, like you can just join an IR, like an yeah. like IRC chat. And it's right there. And, and yeah, like they're always talking about this stuff. And I think yeah. that's, so that's going back to my uh, point earlier. I think that's what this yeah. is really missing. When I was doing Taproot reporting for Coindesk, when I got into IRC chats, I was really kind of blown away at how much coordination and how uh, many um, opposing views there are yeah. and with Bitcoin developers on certain things, right? Not even just about the changes being made to the software, but how you activate that. Yep. And that's the other thing that I've never really seen mainstream media really do a good job at is explaining how software changes to Bitcoin Core get pushed and how they get activated. Yeah. And again, part of the reason why is it's impossible to explain. And there's also just so many differences in the Bitcoin community about who actually activates a soft fork. Yeah. Like one, sorry, one last tangent. Going back to <laughs> Taproot, you're going. Um, people called Taproot a minor activated soft fork. I, I don't really actually think that that's the best framing because what the tap, for, for people who don't know, um, when Taproot was on the table, they couldn't come up with a good way to like the, the core developers were struggling with a way to push the upgrade f uh, forward in, in, in such a way where they could ensure that all the miners would adopt it so that we wouldn't risk a chain split. So what they did is they proposed this thing called speedy trial where miners could signal their support by either appending a one to the end of their blocks in a form of arbitrary data or a zero. Um, and I think it was the one that said they, they acknowledge that they want taproot and zero so we don't want it. Um, and basically it was a certain time frame and if 90 i think it was like if 90 percent of the blocks in that time frame were signaling for taproot then it would get activated yeah and people called this a minor activated software but like it was just voting it was just basically gauging miners interest of like if we push this forward will you update your nodes in time to yeah. make sure that we don't risk a chain split yeah um and so ultimately miners signaled and we ended up getting taproot but the way that taproot's actually adopted is just if you download the software and you run it yourself yeah which we're actually seeing a lot more taproot adoption now with ordinals which is hilarious cool well, we gotta close the show there this is a, a short weekend a little snippet for those power walking through their neighborhoods uh trying to get their mining news in there but we'll close it there colin thank you for joining us we'll definitely see you again here soon i'm sure thanks for having me will always a pleasure sir